rotating things? Well, our, our image is the same thing. Yeah. Mine sounds like the image, when it, when it enlarges or, or uh, increases right. in size, it does it from like a from like corner of the image. Right. As opposed to like from the center. Okay. So I was trying to figure that out, but I didn't, um, couldn't get it to go. Let me bring up mine real quick. Um, it looks sweeter if it, you know, if it yeah, like right. the center. Right. Because I think I had that problem. The question is how to expand the image, do the animation to make it get bigger starting from the center as opposed to starting from, yeah, um, the corner. Um, and I can bring up my animation because I rotated, if you remember my flag animation rotated, but it rotated from the center. And the first pass I had of it did rotate from the, um, that's not what I wanted to do, I wanted to import. Um, did that, so we'll we'll take a look at, yeah, we'll take a look at at how to control that. Now, I don't know if it will necessarily be the same. Yeah. Uh, for the rotate, there was a pivot X and a pivot Y property. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that's what that's what defined to do it from the center as opposed to the edge. Yeah, from the, the corner. For the shrink or grow, I don't know if it has that. Well, let's Google it. That's what did it from the set, rotate from the center instead of from the corner. <clears throat> Scale from center, let's see. It says the same thing. Forget the additional translation. Set Android pivot X, Android pivot Y to half the width and height, and it will scale from the center. What are you looking at? The answer down here. Oh, sorry. So I just Googled Android animation scale from center, and it looks like the top one from Stack Overflow, which has an enormous number of answers. That's the, that, that's rapidly becoming a favorite site. Says again that you use the pivot uh, attribute uh, for that. So so try that. See see how it goes. All right, we're actually going to do a couple things today. Uh, today's kind of a potpourri. We might be a week ahead of where we should be. Um, I, I kind of noticed that. I, I think the Java review went quicker than I thought, and therefore everything else got bumped up. So because of that. Uh, we're going to take our time here, and we're going to talk about something that really isn't related to this class. It, it is, but sort of tangentially. And then we're going to talk about gestures, okay, and, and, and talk about those before we get into the Canon application, which I finally won uh, <laughs> after a number of attempts uh, uh, at it. Yeah. Um, first thing I wanted to talk about is we know the an alternative to developing mobile apps is developing a mobile website. All right? And one thing about mobile websites, um, one, one sort of uh, gripe about them is that um, they, they look clunkier. They look more like websites and web pages like apps. Apps, native apps tend to like look cooler and look smoother and, and have that kind of 
app sheen to them, whereas mobile websites don't typically have. What, uh, what we're talking about currently in my other class, uh, and I promise I'm not doing this strictly to market that other class, but um, that is a good uh, other class, a mobile web development class. What we're doing in there is we're using jQuery mobile to style our uh, mobile to style our pages so that they're even though they're web pages they look like apps, okay? And we can very easily create through using uh, some very simple server side uh, uh, web techniques. We can very easily create a page that looks a certain way in um, a desktop browser and looks sort of like an app on a mobile browser. So let me show you a quick example of that. We'll talk about this for a couple minutes. Again, this is sort of a, a, a side trip, but you know, sometimes the side trips are worth it. All right. First of all, let me pull up the desktop version. That is hosted on our server here. If I can remember the path to it. Ah, let me take two. Let me bring this up in IE, or not in IE. I haven't put in the catches for IE. Okay, let's run this in a relatively newer browser. All right. There's still some issues here. But that's how the page looks. There's a background image and there's some uh, opaque things. The header isn't showing up correctly, but there's a header there. So it looks like a web page. All right. When, however, we view this from a mobile device, it looks more like a mobile app. And here is how it looks viewed on this tablet. All right. Wish I could get down focusing this. But if you notice, it looks more app-like. In other words, these things here, these buttons look like links. And as you click them, this isn't finished yet, but as you click them, you almost get like a little transition over to the next page. And there's a menu bar down here, which is kind of small. But you can go to page to page to page and that looks more app-like. Now this is uh, largely the same code, all right? Uh, and a lot is done with using the jQuery mobile framework and different style sheets to make it look different. Uh, we'll just spend a second looking at the code here. jQuery is JavaScript. Yes. Um, if we were to look at the site, we first of all have one page that looks at the user agent and redirects them either to the mobile site or to the full version of the site. So we do a little bit of scripting to point them. And again, the two sites look like each other in terms of names of files and all that, so I have some level of consistency, but they're, they're housed in different folders. So um, this, uh, this is a nice script that, again, examines the user agent and redirects them uh, different ways. If this gets it wrong, because this script isn't infallible, you know, there could be a mobile device that isn't contained in the script or whatever, you get what I first showed you in IE. That is, you'd get a page on your mobile device that looked like this. Very simple, straightforward, hey, it's not elegant, but it will work in mobile. So if you can imagine a mobile device, the page would look like that. So nothing fancy, but at least it would work. And this would work. This is what it would look like if you like, viewed this on like an old phone, you know, a phone that just had very limited HTML support. But again, it still works, all right? And that's not, uh, not negligible. 
if we look then, I have a lot of my common code in include files, which is a thing in PHP where you can take any code that's shared among several pages and put it in an include file. So for example, the banner, uh, the text for the banner, the text for uh, the credits which are on one page, some of the overview, and the links, the navigation, are all in an include file. And then I simply refer to those include files on my different pages. Now, here's a simple PHP page that again uses the same include files or some of the same include files as my full version page does, but we've added in this jQuery mobile stuff. We link to um, a style sheet and a couple of scripts that get applied depending on the level of JavaScript support that will go and will style that page to make it look mobile app-ish, all right, as opposed to a web page. jQuery mobile takes advantage of these data role attributes on the HTML. So for example, the reason it knew to display um, those links and make them look like buttons is because I put the data role of list view on it. So that's sort of the, the hook that jQuery uses in styling that. So I thought it would be interesting to show this because really um, when you're considering a, a strategy for an organization and if you recall the guy that we had from, I forget the name of the company, Travel centers, yeah. Um, he talked about, for example, like they said BlackBerry support. Well, they're not developing a BlackBerry app, but they're developing something in HTML5 that hopefully will get enough of the, the features across. So more than likely, a mix of mobile website and app will be uh, part of an organization strategy. All right, and I just thought it was interesting to show this how you know, even you can kind of cheat a little bit and kind of get a mobile-ish app version, uh, uh, a web page that, that kind of looks app-like. All right, so I thought that was kind of neat. So, you know, it's something good to play with and it's, it's one of the things that we're talking about in uh, that mobile uh, class. There's obviously a few things I need to do style-wise. You know, the buttons on the bottom are way too small and some of those other things, but, uh, you know, um, it'll be interesting to see how this evolves questions on that. I looked at the next example in the book because I've been kind of going along the examples in the book and it's that canon game and there's a lot in that. All right, There's a lot of code in that and a lot of the code relates to animating it and you know figuring out the angle at which it is and figuring out the trajectory that it should be and so on and so forth. But really the key new thing in this app is the use of gestures. All right? Gestures are, are to a large degree, you know, one of the big things that makes mobile devices mobile devices, right? The fact that you can use your finger to click to, to, to pop something. All right? We've used on click events or, or we, we've coded for on clicking, but things such as dragging, things such as, you know, two finger scrolling, uh, things such as pinching, you know, all those things um, are really uh, things that really make uh, mobile applications pretty powerful and make them sort of distinct from desktop applications. I mean, there's keyboards, uh, you know, you can key data into a, a, a form uh, on a desktop application just like you can on Android. And you can click buttons uh, just like you can uh, on a mobile device. But the gestures are something that you don't do in regular applications. So this really is, is an intrinsic part of mobile development. So I thought I'd spend some time talking about it and my, I wanted to not, or how, how do I say this, I didn't want to cloud the picture with that giant example of the Canon. I wanted to focus just on the mobile thing, all right, I, or the, 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 the gesture thing, all right. So what I did is I found online and I posted the links to them. Um, after 60,000 windows pop up, eventually you'll get to a link to download them if you're interested. Uh, so beware of that before you go into it. Uh, none of the pop-ups were bad per se, but uh, there were just a lot of them. All right. Um, 
yeah, yeah, do something. But I, uh, I, I went and I downloaded a couple applications and I'd like to take a look at them. Uh, this is to trap simple gestures. I just mean like one finger kind of gestures. We're not going to get into like the pinching or that kind of thing uh, yet. We're also not going to talk about yet custom gestures. You can actually build into your app custom gestures. Like typically there's some standard gestures, right? What can you do with a touch screen? You can touch it. You can double tap it. You can swipe it. All right? You can push and hold down. Those are sort of like the standard one finger things that you can do with it. But there's also two finger gestures, you know, like the pinch or like the scroll or, or whatever. And we won't talk about those. But in addition to that, like if you were making a game, you could make uh, a, a gesture where if you did like a circle or a semicircle, that triggered something to happen. All right? And you can, so you can sort of define your own gestures and get them working within your app. But again, that, that's more advanced. So today, the focus is just going to be on sort of the simplistic gestures. So let's do as we've been doing a lot and first look at my sample application, which again is, is not one from the book, but is one I downloaded, which I have posted a link for. Um, let me go and run it. And then away we go. Maybe. Ah. I pulled the little thingy off. There we go. All right, there we go. I'm on the laptop. Okay, I'm going to run this application and we'll look at the behaviors it exhibits and we'll look at the code that, that does it. All right, so if I go run as Android application. It does its thing. Oh, it was already running, so it just brought it to the top. Let's look at what we have here. And what we have here is a big text box. And I wish I could figure out how to focus this better so that it focused um, on the... on there. I have a feeling it's focused like... Yeah, I have a feeling it's focused on the paper as opposed to that. I don't want to start touching things for fear of messing it up. But we can see here, the last thing I did was I tapped. I did a single tap. So let's go through, run through the gestures. We have a single tap. Is that like a there? Yeah, all this is, 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 we'll look at the code. All this is, is it's, it's grabbing the, um, the, the event the gesture event, and it's just, it's just dumping all the parameters for that event. All right? So if I touch it, yeah, and it's telling us a bunch of different things. It's actually telling us how long, yeah, I held it down. I think that's what that means. Yeah, the event time and, and how long it's down, you know, and so on and so forth. Probably the ones most relevant to us are the X and Y coordinates. So we can tell where we were hit. Um, the numbering starts at this corner. So this corner, both the X and Y would be a low number. Down here, they'd both be a high number. Over here, the... Um, I always have to think about this. X should, be low. X should be low and the Y should be high, right? Yeah. Well, uh, again, think of this. This isn't like your typical Cartesian plane, all right? This is zero, zero, but the, your, your thing corresponds to uh, the first quadrant. So there's no negatives in this. So if we're going to look at this, if you can imagine, 
exactly. So if we're looking at this, if this is our standard uh, uh, axis, the tablet is here <laughs> kind of upside down. This is the top of the tablet and this is the uh, left of the tablet and this is the right of the tablet. So if I click here or if I click here in the top now left and right all right, I'm confused because this would be, that's low and low. Yeah, it's the displacement from the upper left, cor left corner. So yeah, this, is, this would be left and this would be top, right. So this is right. So it's kind of like a mirror image flipped upside down of that, which... All right. But we can tell where the position of it is. And, and we use that in the cannon game to move our aim based on the, the position uh, of that. So as we tap on, um, as we tap where we want to aim at, the, our, our little cannon moves uh, to, to point there. So, so the question would be, is it counting in pixels? Right I believe so. So that's really probably the one that's relevant. So that's the, the, the touch or, or the, the, the tap gesture. We can double tap. Kind of the same thing. It tells us the X and Y coordinates, tells us when it happened and so on. But again, probably the most relevant would be the X and Y. There is a hold gesture. So on, or what they call on long press. That's like when I push down and hold it down. And what that, uh, again, that shows us the XY coordinates of, of uh, where that happened. All right. Then lastly, there's a drag gesture, which they call fling. So if I go like that, I get some more information. And the, the different information, uh, that I get here, uh, in addition to um, the starting point, I, I, I see sort of the ending point. So for example, if I go from low to high, or let, let me, let, let's do this, let's, let's go diagonally. This should start out with a low X and Y, and as I gesture that way, the second point should have a higher X and Y. So if I go like that, the X and Y are both low numbers here. The X and Y are both high numbers because I'm flinging from the low to the high. And if I go like this, the X stays relatively constant and the Y changes a lot and so on and so forth. Now, notice, um, and again, it might be a little hard to see, all right? But if you look, there's a description of this as being a motion event, all right? Um, there's two general kinds of events, you know, when the screen gets touched, either it's a touch event or a motion event. So the flinging is a motion event, the touch is, hmm, this is playing a motion event, interesting. I would think that would be a touch event. I'm not sure if that's a bug in the code or what, at any rate. All right, so that's, that's sort of the, the overview of the gestures. Now, let's look at the code that accomplished that. All right. Okay. Here is our um, layout. Not much to the layout, just uh, a text area that says hello, you know, hello world or whatever. 
And then there's a text view where I put the details of the event in. So in other words, all this stuff is what gets put in that second text view. And I made it big so that we could see it. So nothing really exciting there. If we look at, let's see, I don't think there's anything exciting anywhere else until we get to the source. All right. We have our activity, which extends activity, of course. And we do our thing. All right. And we grab a pointer to our gesture event. Um, text view. This is where we're going to put the, the text of what event happened. And this really had me confused until I noticed way down here there's uh, also an attribute for a gesture detector. I didn't see that at first. I'm like, where's it getting that from? And it was really confusing. So anyhow, way down there is a gesture detector. And it is, um, again, it, it's, it, it is going to be what is listening, all right, for, for the uh, uh, touches to the screen. Now, associated with the view is an on-touch event, all right? The on-touch event recognizes that the, that the screen was touched. All right? And then, typically what we do is we turn over that event to a gesture handler to do other stuff with it. I mean, that's consistent sort of with the, the component model of not having one thing do too many things. Right? So, this guy notices, hey, that view has been touched. All right? So, what are we going to do with that? Well, we're going to call the gesture detector on touch event, all right, and we're going to pass it the event that occurred. That event we're just passing through, actually this is trapping for a motion event, all right. Um, we're passing through that event to this guy's on touch event. And we're returning whatever value that happens to return. Okay? Now, which syntax? Well, it's not within the class. No, it, it is. It is. It's just, it, it, it's an attribute of it. Normally you'd see this attribute coded up here. Oh, yeah. So, um, right, the last bracket, yeah. And again, apparently that can't be there because it's using this simple gesture listener which is defined down here, so it has to be down there. So my mistake. I thought that was just sloppy coding to do that. So, what happens then? All right, we've associated with the view, it's on touch event, we're passing that event to our gesture detector, all right, which is a simple on gesture listener. All right. And that has some default events. And that also then causes the appropriate event to be triggered based on the kind of event that happened. So, if we're going to trace this through, if I touch the tablet, what happens? The event, the on-touch event on the view gets triggered. That calls the on-touch event on the detector, all right? 
We haven't overrided that code, so it calls the ancestors on touch event, and that on touch event then, in turn, will call the on double tap, on fling, on long press, or on simple tap methods. Okay? So the missing thing, the thing that we're not seeing here, is the gesture detectors uh, on touch event. And essentially what that's doing is that's making sure the appropriate uh, on event here is getting called. All right, that's all in the ancestor, so there was no need to override it, so we didn't. All right, and that's calling this. And what are these things doing? Uh, these things are simply setting that text um, with the um, motion event. All right for, um, with, with the motion event and the arguments, the two string of the argument. All right. They have with, associated with a fling, a velocity, all right, as well. So not only do we get that, notice that with a, a fling, there's two events. Because you could think of a fling as being kind of like touching the first point, touching the last point. All right. Uh, in addition, um, we get a velocity associated with it in both directions. So let's do a fling and, and pay attention to the velocity. Because I could do approximately the same thing. and have one velocity, or I could do the same gesture and have a different velocity. Here the velocity was negative uh, 51x, negative 23y. If I do that same gesture quicker, notice that that velocity becomes a lot higher. Even though the xy points are similar. It is funny you get a negative. I would think you'd get a negative if you went this way, but if you go this way, I think you'd always get positive. Maybe I'm going so slow that it's confusing it. I don't know. Maybe it's not really considering that a fling, maybe it's considering it a touch, I don't know. Because yeah, you know, if you think that it's a change in x over time, that would imply that x is getting smaller, which would mean I'm getting closer to that corner. So I can see in that case, my guess is, is my slow things aren't really showing as flings. There I go. Yeah, these, these numbers make more sense now. Which is nice to know because you can then, you know, if you think about it, you know, depending on how vigorously they, they fling, you might want to act differently, you know. Um, trying to think, you know, I mean that has a lot of implications in gaming, but even in other things. If you're scrolling through, let's say a list of photos that are in a, a, a scroll. If you just nudge it, you might want to flip to the next photo or a couple photos over. Well, if you whoom, give it a turn, you'd want it to, you know, scroll through a, a bunch of them. So, questions on this. This is sort of, again, the simple events, and we captured the, um, the, the four basic events, the, 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 the tap, the double tap, the fling, and the um, long press. All right, and again, here all we're doing is we're just spitting out a message that says that it's recognized. But I think it's good to see that because that gives you some insight about like what those attributes are associated with that. So let's go. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's go and let me close this one and let me bring up the other one, which is similar to this, but. All this one does is it, um, what does it do? It looks at only swipes, it only looks at flings, and it, it tells you what direction it's, you're, you're flinging 
things. <laughs> yeah, not really the angle so much, but are you, did you, did you fling down? Did you fling up? Did you fling to the right? Did you fling to the left? Did you fling up and right? Up and to the left, and so on. So let's go and... I think this was that one. Uh, let me go and actually I'm going to go and make the text bigger so that we can read it. Or did they already do that? Looks like maybe they already did that. Good. All right, so this doesn't do anything if you touch it or double touch it or hold it down long, a long touch. But if you fling, it tells you what direction it's going. Let me go in and ah, I want to make that bigger, so I'll put in the code to make the text bigger. Let's run it again. So that we can actually see it. So if I swipe down, it tells me I sw I've swiped down. If I swipe up, it tells me I've swiped up. If I swipe to the right, left, or if I do left and up, left and down, oh, right and down, left and down, right and up. I'm confusing myself, but you, get, you probably get the idea better, <laughs> better than me. So it, it, it can tell you that, because again, that, those gestures might be meaningful, all right? Um, the direction that you swipe. You know, it definitely, you know, if you swipe this way, you, you want a different behavior than if you swipe that way, probably. All right, if you, let's say, you're, you're scrolling through again, I'm thinking like a photo album. If you're to, to swipe that way, you want to move to the picture following. If you swipe the other way, you might want to move to the picture preceding, for example. So sometimes you might not really, you, you might care about the velocity, you might not, but you probably all the time will care about the direction that the swiping was in. So let's take a look at the code here. Now, this is what I changed by the way, to make the text bigger, I made the text size 30 SP from whatever the default, I don't think I had a setting before, so it must have been the default. All right. Um, very similar code. On touch event, again, I'm calling the gesture detector's touch event, and I'm passing it. But if you notice this time, I've only overridden the on fling code. So that's why none of the other things mattered, none of the other gestures mattered. I didn't write any code, so therefore the super classes got called and nothing really happened. All right. So the only code that I did was the... Um, was the, um, the, the, the fling. And the fling, what it does is it looks at the initial x, which is E1's get x, and, e, and then subtracts that from E2's get x. So it's looking at the x coordinate of the first touch, the x coordinate of the last touch. All right? And if that is greater than a certain tolerance, a certain sensitivity, then it knows that I've swiped to the left. So if I go from, if we go like this, here to here, there to there, 
it knew that the difference between the x of the first and the x of the second was more than the small amount of tolerance, so therefore it knew it was swiped to the left. It does a similar thing for um, swiping to the right, except it reverses the order. It looks to see the second one, um, the difference between the, the, you take the second one and subtract the first one's x position. So, yeah, sensitivity is a variable because um, if I was swiping this, you know, you don't want to make it so if I just go up even one pixel, it tells me that I've gone up. So they've given a sensitivity of like 50 pixels. So like if I set this to zero, yeah, if I set that variable to zero, then I better go straight to the left with, yeah. So if I go like this, it thought I went down, even though it sure looked to me like I went to the right. So, I would have to get it dead on, likewise to the left. You know, it's going to think I went up no matter what. I can't get it exactly to the left. If, on the other hand, I made this some ridiculous number, like if I made it 200, all right, then if I went up like that, it still it thinks I just went left because I went like that. Well, like that. Oh. Well then you're gonna have to take my word for it. Now if I go like this, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to make it obvious I'm going up a little bit. And it just said I went left because the sensitivity is too much. So that just builds a little tolerance into it so that you don't have to be dead on accurate uh, to do that. So that's something you could probably play with if you're writing the app for whatever context you were doing in, if it made sense. If, for example, you're only interested in uh, the left or right swipe, you might not have any tolerance. So, you know, even if I went, whoom, to the left and up, it wouldn't care. Whereas if it did matter, then, then you know, then, then you'd put a, a tighter tolerance on it. Now, one thing that, that well, as I was looking exa uh, for examples for this, one thing that I noticed that a lot of things did, a lot of examples did, is they wrote an activity, they wrote this class to extend the activity and to implement that um, um, simple on gesture listener class. So what they could do is they could get away with just not creating that anonymous class and just have this guy do that as well. You know, that's six of one, half dozen the other. Um, whichever you think is clear, I guess it doesn't really matter one way uh, or another. All right. So this is a, this is the basic uh, uh, processing of gestures. All right. Um, I have noticed, I, I did realize something like two minutes before class started. I did not assign you a new assignment this week. All right. Uh, so uh, I will make sure I, I correct that. The, well, the one that's due today, I haven't. I, typically, I assign like the day that one is due. I make sure that there's one assigned for the next week. So that's something I'll do tonight or tomorrow, real quick. Um, at any rate, um, what I like to do, and you can bet somehow it'll have something to do with gestures. All right, it'll it'll be in there. Um, I had, I, I really normally like to plan everything over the weekend, very hectic weekend, I wasn't able to get it planned, so I had my notes to plan it yesterday, didn't get to it yesterday, had my notes to plan the class today, I did get to it today, but somehow I forgot that part of planning the class is also coming up with a homework assignment for next week, so I missed that one. What I'd like to do now is, now that we've had sort of the overview of the gesture processing, Let's go and let's look at the, at the canon game, all right? Because there's more to the canon game than just the gestures, but I wanted to sort of abstract that portion of it and talk about that in a little more detail before we got on um, that. Quick question. Mm -hmm. when, when you're grading our homework, are, should, we, should we be targeting you know, your Phone size. 
I, I typically test them on a tablet. Um, I, ideally, it should look good across uh, uh, situations that we can look at some, you know, we can look to see if, if it doesn't look good in a given environment. We can, we can uh, um, you know, we can see maybe what, what uh, could happen to change that. But typically, I do test it on a tablet. Uh, I like these seven inch tablets. You know, they're less bulky to carry around. You know, they're not, they're not quite as big. And I do like the Samsung Galaxy. And apparently, Samsung's allowed to sell them in the United States again. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I just I saw right before class that that, uh, that ban has been lifted so they can sell them here uh, again. I just, I just got a Galaxy 7. Uh-huh. Um, actually, I'm going to exchange it. Because I don't know what size it has to Oh, okay, right, right, all right. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah, they were banned. They were banned for selling them as part of the, the whole Apple brouhaha. Yeah. All right. Canon game. Let's play the Canon game. Let's look to see how this behaves first. Yeah, well, maybe that maybe that's an alternate uh, alteration that we can we can look at making. Uh, how how can we maybe set a parameter uh, uh, to allow that? That would be something to, to well, you know the mind reels uh, for for Thursday uh, of what we can do in class. Yeah. Um, by the way, just as a as a as a question, you can you're good to go to develop on that machine, right? So, yeah, so if I were to bring uh, an activity in that said alter the canon to do this, you'd be able to, to go and do it on that. Is that correct? So, like, in other words, the DDL? If we yeah, if we were working on the DDL exercises. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I could do an all work on okay. Mac Good. Machines. Good. Because if we just have one machine to do that, you know, we don't have that big of a class, you know, uh, so, so, you know, we could share it and, and work together uh, on that. So, well, hopefully, have mine. Okay, excellent. All right, so let's go and run this. Oh, you were just asking if I had clips. Yeah, if, if everything loaded and ready to ready to roll. Okay, here we go. Darn it! Ooh, let's try again. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, uh, yeah, I think it deducts some if you hit the the barrier, and if you hit something that you're aiming at, you get added time. Yeah. Yeah. Let's look at what's going on here that's relevant to us. Let's let's first talk about gestures. This is interested uh, in in really two gestures. All right. It's interested in the touch gesture. Because the touch gesture aims the cannon. And it doesn't matter like a swipe, it just, yeah, so you can swipe it. Yeah. The other thing that this is interested in, and is this interested in a double tap? All right. So from a gesture perspective, it's interested in those two things. It's interested in any sort of touch, because that causes the cannon to aim, and it's interested in the double tap. All right. So let's make a note of that. It is, it is noisy. It's gloriously noisy. I, forget the, I, I forgot how loud I had it set the one time and, and nearly scared the bejesus out of myself as it started making the crashing noises. So that's something new. I don't think we had any um, audio. In any uh, of the of the the things, um, one thing to notice, and and we'll look at this, is if you notice this, um, it is it is filling in values in a string, and we'll take a look at that. Um, for example, uh, yeah, I can't really see it. What do you, what do you mean? 
Uh, in other words, um, the string isn't a hard-coded string. The string has a parameter in it. So in other words, like let's say if you get, let's say if you uh, were taking a quiz, it, the string might allow you to say you got five questions correct. You know, normally when you think about that, you'd think of sentence A, sentence B, and you'd concatenate them. Here, what they've done is they've put a parameter smack dab in the middle of the string, so that it'll get filled in with a value that you pass it. They do that because the one thing they said is, is that when you localize it, the number may vary exactly where it appears. You know, like, you know, I, you know uh, shamefully I don't really speak anything but English. I don't even really speak that all that well either. But, uh, you know, like uh, you had five correct, you know. The French version or the Spanish version or the German version might not have the five right before correct. It might be somewhere else in the sentence. So they allow you to localize it with that parameter. So we'll see an example of that uh, in here. Uh, there's sounds and there's also animation that isn't the tween animation where we simply give uh, a view a behavior we're actually dynamically drawing that as it goes back and forth and we're changing it as you hit pieces of the target, the pieces disappear. If you hit the, 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 the barrier, it bounces off and, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of new things uh, in this one. So we won't get through all of them today, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll take a look at, at at least the ones that are most relevant uh, to us and then we'll decide what we're going to do on Thursday. All right. So, let's look at it. Let's start down here. Is there anything in the manifest? Ah, you had a good question. We might as well try it now. The difference between portrait and vertical. Yeah, does, does that matter? This is set to having a orientation of portrait, which means that if I go and turn it, here this is probably better, easier to show this way, it's still the same. Let's see, does it matter if I say vertical? Did I spell vertical right? Maybe it's not a thing. Hmm. Yeah. That's okay. Nothing happened. I got an error when I tried to do uh, when I tried to do uh, vertical. So now we're back going for that. All right. So nothing really big uh, in the uh, manifest, except again, the nature of this game is that you wouldn't want it flopping around and switching. So uh, they, they, they set the, the orientation to just be portrait. Um, the strings. Here's what I mean about parameters. All right. Actually, it wasn't where I thought it was. It was in the total, the shots fired, and the time remaining. Notice how those strings have a little formatting thingy in them. All right. That allows you to, again, when you localize it, put the number, like this says time remaining, some number of seconds. You know, that allows you to put that number in different spots in the sentence uh, d depending on, on, on how it's appropriate for that, that language. Right. Yeah, right. In other words, maybe in French it would be, you know, I don't know, at the beginning of the sentence or whatever. Remaining, yeah, exactly. 
and likewise with shots fired and all that. So. Quotes around the strings? No. Yeah. Um. Then you'd probably put quotes after it. Yeah. In other words, if you wanted. Seconds not to be the end, but you wanted some blank stuff, then yeah, you probably would need to put quotes there. I, I'm trying to think. I, I'm not sure if I've seen them uh, with quotes. All right, so that's that piece of it. Um, we have. In our raw resources, we have the different WAV files of stuff that gets uh, played based on uh, what happens in our game. Our main layout is a little bit different as well because if you look, normally with our layout we have you know all the different controls. We have a linear layout, we have these controls and all that. Here we've written our custom view. We've, we've created a custom canon view for this and that's the only element in the main layout. So we'll see, uh, we'll see uh, how that's used um, as we move into the example. All right. So the main layout is again very, very simple. Uh, Where is our canon view? Uh, it's up here. There is We, have, we actually have the Canon game, uh, which is our activity, and then we have the Canon view, which is our view. And we define that custom. We can just take a brief look at this. The Canon game Java, again, is our activity. It extends activity. We have all the stuff associated with that. This is actually very simple. All right. This code is very, very simple. All right. The canon game, I'm sorry, the canon view is where most of the stuff is. All right? And that's where there's tons of methods and stuff like that. All right? This is what actually does the math and figures out the angle and does all that kind of stuff for, for that. We also have another class, which I, 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 I had to sit down and put a cold cloth on my head when I saw this, but they use public attributes in this class. <gasps> Gasp. Um, I don't like that. I, you know, I guess uh, in the grand scheme of things, um, you know, is it the most horrible thing to do? No. You know, there, there's worse things that you could do. But I still don't like it. I don't like that, this especially because since you can access those um, uh, directly, you know, um, you, could, you could, you know, who knows what you could do. You could create potentially, uh, potential problems uh, associated with that. I thought that was odd too. I, I thought that was very odd as well. Uh, but that there wasn't already a class line. Yeah, that, that does this. So, yeah, I, I, I did a double take on that one as well. All right, let's look at the Canon game and let's see how how this is handled. All right. Let's see. We 
we create our gesture detector as a new gesture detector. We associate it with this view and it's of type gesture listener, which if we look down here, here's our gesture listener that we create. So remember how this works, all right? Anything that you do on the view, all right, anything that you do as far as touching the screen goes, all right, gets handled by the on-touch event of the view. And then that view can then go and call the gesture handler to see specifically what gesture happened, all right? So... On this, in this case, our view, its on touch event, goes and looks at it. I was mistaken about uh, the motion event and touch event. They're all motion events, but the two options that you have are, are, are action down or action move. In other words, did you just touch the screen or did you move your finger as you went across? So that's your two options. But either way, they're aligning the cannon. They're calling this method to align the cannon with, with what we touch. And we pass the event to it. All right. We'll look at the cannon view later and we'll see exactly what al aligning the cannon means. All right. But just know that regardless of what we do, when we touch that, we're aligning the cannon. We call that align method. And we pass the event what are the information we can get from the event? What are some of the parameters? Well, the X coordinates, the Y coordinates, all those other things. All right. So, what this is saying is if we touch it, we're going to align the cannon. Doesn't matter how we touch it. Then, we call the gesture detectors on touch event to go and handle if we've done anything specific. All right. Remember, that on touch event on the view gets hit regardless of how it's been touched. We then call the gesture detector, which can then go and process the different kinds of touches in a different way. So, the only other thing that we're interested in doing other than aligning the cannon, which we do regardless of how it was touched, all right? The only other thing that we're interested in, so the only job of that listener, is to handle the double tap. So therefore we have, we only have defined the on double tap event on this. We've only overridden it. So we're ignoring swipes. So this guy doesn't get into handling the swipes, or this guy doesn't get into the handle the long press, or this one doesn't get into handling um, really any of the events other than the double touch. And what does that do? Well, it calls the cannon views fire cannonball method. And it passes the event. All right. So the cannon view really is where most of the code is. All that's in the view is you know, hooking up the, uh, the, 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 the main view, all right, and the gesture handling. That's about all that goes on in that main view, all right, is that it handles the gesture handling and then it calls events or calls methods on the canon view um, that correspond to the events that have happened on the main view, all right. On every touch, it aligns it. Yes. Also, it's a double touch. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So this exactly. So this event get fires off regardless of what they're doing. So if they're double touching or they're single touching, that gets fired off. And then it then calls the gesture detector 
to see if it's been double touched because if it's double touched, then we want to go and shoot it. Uh huh. Well, because that's the last thing it's going to do. That's the last thing it's going to do is it's going to it's going to take whatever whatever that overridden method returns is going to go and return it. Remember this method here, the untouch event. That's in the ancestor, right? This is something we're overriding. And the signature of this event, on touch event, is it gets us an argument emotion event and it returns a Boolean. So this guy, this thing here, has to return a Boolean. Alright? Well, where does it get it from? Well, it delegates that and whatever this guy returns, it's going to return. So, again. Um, we could probably write code. We could probably write code to do something like this. Let's say we were we were making a puzzle. You know, we were doing like a, a jigsaw puzzle, and we had a bunch of pieces off to the side, and we were assembling them inside a frame. Let's say we drug a piece somewhere that was outside of the frame, somewhere where we we're not allowed to put the piece, or we 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 drag a piece on top of another piece, or we we make in other words we make an illegal move move. What's likely will happen is our code will detect that that's an illegal move and it will return a false and that will back out that event. So, so just a question. Mm -hmm. In the untouch event, right before we're done the return statement, yes. you could rewrite that if you wanted to and have gesture detector untouch event event called sentence before the return. Right. Return or, or return. You wouldn't want to return true. You want to return whatever that guy says. You're delegating that operation. You're delegating that gesture to this class. So whatever this class says, the results of that gesture is that's what this guy's going to say. So you could do something like this. Boolean uh, B. B equals, yeah, yeah. Right, right, yeah, yeah. So in other words, yeah, you could do that. What that what they had is just shorthand for that. You know, it 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 calls that function, grabs the return value, and simply returns it. All right. Um, let me go and reset that to where it was. So again, I want to just take a quick look at this again uh, of the actual application now that we've seen the way the events are wired in it. All right. So the game is starting. I touch. I touch. I drag. I long touch. Anything I do, that code is being processed by the views, the main views, or I'm sorry, the activities on touch. All right, method. Because any way we touch, that we're calling the canons align canon method, which lines up the canon. Again, how it does it, that's the beauty of encapsulation. We don't care how it does it, it does it. We just know that that is wired that way. Now, what happens when we double click on it though? Yeah. You're also calling that second. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Strictly speaking, yeah, you're right. We're calling the gesture detectors on touch event two, and there's nothing to do in those cases because there's no code for a, a, a single touch or a, a long touch or a swipe. So, this is interesting. Because 
Right. In other, in other words, the question is, is where does the on-touch event code live? Right? Okay, here we have to speculate, all right? Because this code lives in the ancestor, okay? So, here's how it probably is, okay? We have the ancestor here, all right? It has a on-touch event that gets past an event and returns a boolean. Okay? So, what does that on touch event do? There's a case statement in there that looks at the kind of event and either calls the on double tap or the on fling or the on uh, long touch. This is, in the this is in the ancestor. So there's a case statement in that on touch that looks at the event and depending on what it is it calls that objects on double tap, on fling, on whatever. And in fact it gets the return value from there and returns whatever these guys return. Now, what do these functions look like? Well, on the ancestor, they don't do anything. It doesn't know what you want to do if you double click or fling. So, the on fling event probably just returns true. Yep. They fling their finger. <laughs> All right, they sure did. Because it doesn't know what else to do. It simply says, yeah, that event happened. So if you don't override it, all that happens is it's going to call this on touch event. The on touch event is going to see that there was a fling done. The fling is going to call the on fling event, and that's probably just going to return a true. So that's probably what the code looks like there. Now, on our specific instance, we override, in this case, the on double tap that gets an event and returns a boolean. And we have our code here. So, when they double tap, this guy says, okay, call on double tap and return whatever that guy returns. Well, instance of polymorphism, right, this refers to, not the ancestor, but this instance is the one that gets called. So this instance double tap event gets called, it does its thing, returns a value, and that return value then gets returned to the on touch, which it then returns back to whoever called it. All right. So the idea is that the code here, oops, the code here for all those other events is not overridden, so it probably just simply, the ancestor probably just simply returns true. Alright? So, we can speculate, just sort of, you know, speculate how that works, and I'm pretty confident that's probably how it works. That the uh, uh, on-touch event for this gesture detector, simply by virtue of being a simple on-gesture uh, listener, looks at the event and calls the appropriate method and if you didn't override it really nothing happens it just returns true if you have overridden it then it goes and does its thing all right so when we double tap on it to kind of finish the loop here 
No problem. When we double tap it, it aligns and then shoots. Why? Well, the touch event on the view goes off. That does the alignment. It then calls the gesture detectors on touch event, which realizes that that was actually a double touch or double tap, and therefore it calls this event and then it fires it. So that's why if you double tap, it really does both those things because any sort of contact with the screen, it does the alignment, then it calls that. And we could write, you know, we could write code here. on fling. Why am I getting a warning? Yeah. Thank you. Now I'm probably missing two, there's probably two arguments. Yeah, E1. Yeah, E2. Should be a comma. Let's look and see what the on fling event is. Is you, you're, yeah, let's. Yeah. Yeah. Were those doubles? Yeah, why, why speculate? I'll just go and import that guy and look at it. It's a float, not uh, that. Okay. Okay. So we could then go and say, hey, wherever you end up, fire it there on the fling event. So, so I go and, oops. yeah, I, I wish all games were like this, right? You know, you <laughs> having trouble on that level of Tetris, yeah, just go in and. Right, right, right. Yeah, so now we can, whoops. Yes. <laughs> All right. So again, we saw how, how we were able then to capture that gesture. Originally, it ignored the fling. Well, let me rephrase that. Originally, the gesture uh, detector ignored it because we didn't override that method. The views on touch event handled it, all right, and it handled it by simply um, 
you know, refocusing uh, the, the cannon. But now we actually put code in the gesture detector to do something a little more if they do a flame. Questions about this? Alrighty. I promise I will have an assignment for you, you know, either today or early tomorrow. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I'm sure you're probably not that worried about it. Uh, and we'll continue uh, on this on uh, Thursday. I'm not really sure what we're going to do. We might look more at this, or we might play around with this, like, you know, see if we can add some functionality to it. So I'll, I'll see what, what seems to make sense. All right. Thank you. Can you